This is Kick-Ass Politics. I'm Ben Mathis. Hey folks, I have a quick announcement. We're changing things up a little and starting a new crowdfunding campaign with Patreon.com. You can still make a one-time donation through our GoFundMe campaign, but Patreon is a little different and it's kind of exciting. With Patreon, you pledge a certain amount each month And in return for helping sustain the show, you're going to get some fun benefits like back episodes, exclusive content, show merchandise, shout outs on the podcast, video hangouts, and invitations to live events. Membership has its privileges, and you can check out all of the rewards at patreon.com backslash kickasspolitics, or click on the Patreon link in the show notes for this episode. It's a way for you to show your ongoing support for the podcast and sustain the show long term. It'll be a big help to me because, frankly, I pay for all of this out of my own pocket. And believe me, it adds up. Again, go to patreon.com backslash kickasspolitics. Thanks for your support and thanks for continuing to listen. And now, enjoy the podcast. Hi. I'm Ben Mathis, and welcome to Kick-Ass Politics. If you've been paying attention to recent podcast episodes, you've probably noticed that one word keeps popping up a lot lately. It came up in my discussion with Professor Michio Kaku, it came up with Alec Ross in our talk about his book Jobs of the Future, and Steve Case in our discussion of the next big tech wave. I'm talking about genomics. Since 2003, when the Human Genome Project produced a complete map of the genome, researchers and scientists are now only beginning to realize the potential of this colossal breakthrough. It opens the door to further leaps in the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of just about every disease, including cancer. Genomics will likely also play a crucial role in the understanding and treatment of addiction and mental health not to mention the doors it could open in bioengineering and synthetic biology. There's even talk of one day being able to clone a woolly mammoth and other extinct species. But with all that comes difficult ethical questions, such as what if an individual's genetic information falls in the wrong hands, and could it be used against them by, say, insurers, or employers, or even a potential mate? How far might we push the boundaries of genomics with designer babies, and how close are we coming to playing God? So today, I'm consulting the expert, Dr. Francis Collins. He's currently the director of the National Institutes of Health, and prior to that, he served as the director of the National Center for Human Genome Research and the International Human Genome Sequencing Consortium, where he headed up the Human Genome Project. Dr. Collins has dedicated his life to genomics, and his work as a quote-unquote gene hunter has led to his pioneering of techniques that have dramatically sped up research and led to the identification of the genes responsible for many diseases like type 2 diabetes and cystic fibrosis. An evangelical Christian, Dr. Francis Collins has also been a leader in encouraging conversations about the moral and ethical implications of genomics. He served as president of the BioLogos Foundation, which promotes discourse on the relationship between science and religion, and which led Pope Benedict to appoint him to the Catholic Church's Pontifical Academy of Sciences. Among his many other honors, Dr. Francis Collins is also the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the National Medal of Science. Since taking over as director of the National Institutes of Health, He spearheaded a number of innovative projects that seek to take advantage of recent advances in genomics, including the Accelerating Medicines Partnership, to help speed up the development and approval of new drugs and treatments to the marketplace, the Brain Initiative, which is working on advances in understanding how the brain works, the Precision Medicine Initiative, which is building on recent genomic research to tailor treatments to individual patients' needs, and the National Cancer Moonshot Initiative. Today, Dr. Collins will explain just how genomics works and what the Human Genome Project teaches us. He'll talk about how genomics has led to breakthroughs in our understanding of many diseases 
and how it's helping scientists and doctors make leaps in early detection of diseases and more targeted and effective treatments. He'll also talk about the limits of genomics and how environmental factors come into play with diseases like cancer, and he'll discuss some of the ethical and regulatory issues. Coming up with Dr. Francis Collins, Director of the National Institutes of Health, in just a moment. To Washington, it's time for Kick Ass Politics. And now here's your host, Ben Mathis. I'm joined over the phone by Dr. Francis Collins, the renowned physician and gene hunter who led the Human Genome Project, which is to this day the largest collaborative biological project in history. And now he's the director of the National Institutes of Health, where he's continuing that work. Dr. Francis Collins, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Glad to talk with you today. Well, first of all, you led the Human Genome Project, in which, as I'm reading it here, your team sought to determine the sequencing of chemical base pairs which make up human DNA and identify and map all of the genes of the human genome from both a physical and functional standpoint. So for those of us who aren't gene hunters, put that in layman's terms for us. Sure, I'll try. Well, it's useful to think of the genome as an instruction book. It's actually a pretty good analogy. And all of us have a genome. We inherited half of it from mom and half from dad. And every one of our cells carries that entire book. It's about three billion letters long. So if you had to print it out in reasonable sized font on reasonable thickness paper with reasonable margins and pile those on top of each other, that information would be about the height of the Washington Monument. And it is pretty amazing to contemplate the fact that you have all of that inside each cell of your body. And every time the cell divides, you've got to copy the whole thing. Wow. And until the Genome Project came along, uh, we had little bits and pieces of that instruction book that people had worked on, oftentimes because they were searching for the cause for a particular disease, oftentimes without success. But we didn't have the whole thing. And the idea that you could read out that kind of a script uh, seemed in 1990 when the project started pretty risky and, and maybe even doomed to fail. But it was uh, as a result of more than 2,000 scientists who ultimately worked together on this project in six countries with a lot of technology that had to be invented and then applied. Uh, it was possible uh, to get this done, in fact, about two years ahead of schedule and at a budget that was several hundred million dollars less than originally proposed. So think of that, for a federally funded project ahead of schedule under budget. Yeah, you don't hear that often. No, you don't. Well, genomics has only really kicked into high gear over the past couple of decades, and it's a very labor-intensive process. But early in your career as a quote-unquote gene hunter, which I love that term, you pioneered a method known as chromosome jumping, which sped up the process. Is that why genomics is now suddenly kind of coming out of nowhere and becoming a big thing? Well, not exactly. I'm At the time that I was doing this chromosome jumping thing, there was no genome project. Uh, the entire genome was a uh, inscrutably difficult, uh, complex instruction book that we knew existed, but we didn't have much of the pages. And if you were hunting, as I was, for genes that were responsible for diseases like cystic fibrosis, you could sometimes know you were in the right volume of this multi-volume encyclopedia, but you couldn't find the actual cause, which might be as subtle as one letter out of place. Hmm. And jumping allowed you to move around in that ex- that volume more readily than if okay. you just had to go painfully word by word. But, you know, today, uh, because all of this was produced by the Genome Project and is freely available on the Internet, what it took us to find the cystic fibrosis gene, which was several groups working flat out for five years, could be done now by a pretty good graduate student in less than a week. Wow. Yeah. And that's one of the exciting things to come out of this is the HapMap project, 
The HapMap is used to find genetic variants affecting health, disease, and responses to drugs and environmental factors. And the information produced by that project, like you said, is made freely available for research. What kind of diseases have researchers been able to identify the genes for because of this? Well, basically, if you're talking about a disease that's inherited in a very predictable way uh, caused by alterations in a single gene, something like cystic fibrosis or Huntington's disease or sickle cell anemia, uh, those diseases, of which there are about 7,000, have almost all now had their specific genes identified because the technology makes that possible. Even for very rare diseases where you may have only a few families, uh, that kind of success is now routinely happening. What's more complicated is to try to understand what are the genetic factors in common disorders like diabetes or Alzheimer's disease or schizophrenia or asthma where you know there are hereditary factors because those diseases tend to run in families, but they're not caused by alterations in a single gene. Instead, it turns out, in most of those, there are dozens of genes that have subtle variations that slightly increase your risk, depending on which one you have. And we've discovered most of those now, too, because the HapMap and what came after it made it possible even to find those subtle findings. Interesting. So the more common the disease, the harder it is to identify the genes for it. Exactly. Um, Well, once you do identify the genes for a particular disease, how is that information then put into use in trying to fight that disease? Sure. Well, take diabetes, which is a disease that unfortunately is increasingly frequent uh, around the world, in part because it's associated with increased risk in people who have gained too much weight. But basically, we now know of about 80 different variations in specific parts of the genome that place people at risk. And you can use that information to then identify whether somebody is at high risk even before they've developed diabetes. Uh, That's one of the reasons, uh, for instance, six years ago when I got that information, that I sort of woke up to the fact I wasn't taking good care of myself and uh, got on an exercise program and lost (laughs) 35 pounds, which I've kept off because I didn't want to get that disease. Right. But most of what we learn, because the genetic information, as I said, is not particularly open and shut. It's not yes or no. It's sort of statistical. It does, however, point you to really important discoveries about what is that disease caused by anyway? What are the molecular underpinnings of a disease like diabetes? And what could you do if you know that to develop better treatments? So it's been an increasingly impressive set of insights into drug development coming from the study of the genome. Yeah, it's very exciting. And uh, how has this been applied to, say, cancer? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I think cancer has been the place where the study of the genome has had the greatest impact. Let's be clear. Cancer can have hereditary predispositions. Uh, Certainly families, for instance, that have breast and ovarian cancer and are found to have misspellings in the genes called BRCA1 and BRCA2. Those are hereditary, get passed from generation to generation. We've learned a fair amount about those, but most people aren't in a situation where they have this very high hereditary risk, but a lot of people do get cancer. So what's that about? Well, cancer is basically a disease of the genome, but in most cancers, the mistakes in that instruction book were not ones you were born with. They happened during your lifetime. And sometimes they happened because of exposure to something like cigarette smoke or UV uh, radiation to your skin. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they just happen because copying three billion letters, sometimes everything doesn't go quite right. But what that means is that if I got cancer today, the most important information that I'd want to know is what exactly is going on in the genome of those cancer cells, which mutations in that genome are driving those good cells uh, to do bad things and grow when they're not supposed to. Because if I know that, then I can pick a treatment that's actually precise for me and not a one-size-fits-all chemotherapy approach, which is what we've been doing mostly in the past. Yeah. It sounds like what you're saying to me, specifically, particularly with cancer, but probably with a lot of these diseases, genomics is not a be-all, end-all. There is the environmental yeah. factor, which is what we actually have some some control over. 
And it's a good thing because most of us will not be in a circumstance where we can go in and fix our instruction <laughs> books. There, What you have is the cards you were dealt, but yeah. you can figure out how you want to play the hand, and you can alter then your environment, your dietary plan, your yeah. medical surveillance uh, to try to take account. Or if you develop cancer, you can, in fact, figure out what's driving your cancer and choose the therapy that has the best chance of curing you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll ask you about this uh, because when when someone said this to me, it was rather exciting to me. Um, a guest previously had said that within probably the next 10 years, we will have a chip in our toilet that will analyze us on a molecular level and will be able to alert us the moment that we have a cancer cell. And then we can go and get that zapped or whatever it is that, that they plan on doing. Is that is that potentially, is that realistically where we're heading? I'm not sure I am... I'm... Is it that uh, down simple? With the chip in the toilet idea. But the okay, idea but, of but being in, able is to it that assess. simple? That will that is that is is technology that's that simple within our grasp? Maybe even simpler. Really? Because cancer cells have the propensity to actually be not very efficient. They grow fast, but they grow clumsily, and so some of the cells actually die and they spill their DNA, and that DNA ends up in your bloodstream. And people are now getting into a very interesting kind of technology of being able to find those snippets of DNA that spilled from a cancer cell just by taking a simple blood sample wow. and determine that somebody who thinks they're actually fine uh, has the earliest signs of a malignancy. Right now, that's primarily being done for people who've had cancer and you're looking to see if they've had a relapse. But people are proposing using that for all of us as a screen, as the kind of blood test you might want to have once a year or maybe even every six months to see if there's an early sign of trouble because an awful lot of cancers that we don't do very well treating right now, we could probably do much better if we caught them earlier. Take pancreatic cancer, for instance, which is so, so scary because of a poor five-year survival rate. The only people who actually do well, though, are the ones where you catch it really early. Maybe we could catch everybody early. That would be a good thing. Yeah, that's exciting stuff. With all of these advances in genomics comes an understandable concern about privacy of genetic information and worries that individuals could potentially be discriminated against by employers or health insurers based on their genetics. You've taken some steps to address that. That has been a concern from the very beginning uh, of the Genome Project with the expectation that more and more people would want to have genetic information about themselves for their own health purposes, but would that get used against them, which seemed patently discriminatory and unfair. So over the course of 12 years of discussions about this uh, with policymakers, with ethicists, and ultimately with the Congress, uh, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, uh, GINA, uh, was passed by both houses of Congress and signed into law uh, by President uh, George W. Bush. I was there in the Oval Office when he signed it. And that was a big moment. That says that if you have genetic information about yourself and it reaches your health insurer or your employer, they may not use it uh, or they are under some criminal criminal penalties. Okay. There's a serious uh, deterrent. To that. Yep. Okay. Well, that's good. So if this information ended up in the hands of my insurer, I could not be denied because I have a certain genetic code for uh, Brighton's disease or, or whatever. You could not be denied any kind of access to health care insurance. Now, to be clear, life insurance is still uh, not something that is protected. Oh, interesting. And you can kind of see why the insurance industry uh, was able to win on that argument, because if you have people who have a genetic predisposition to some very serious disease that's likely to lead to early death, and they go out and load up on life insurance, yeah. and the insurer doesn't know, then pretty much the whole system falls apart. That's what's called adverse selection. Yeah. So at the moment, anybody who's thinking about getting a genetic test uh, ought to be aware that that could compromise their ability to buy an infinite amount of life insurance if it turns out they have something in their DNA that suggests they're at high risk. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and then I'll be back to talk more with Dr. Francis Collins, back in just a moment. Hey, folks. Do you like reading, but find it harder and harder to make time to curl up with a good book? Well, there's a solution. Give audiobooks a try. 
They're perfect for your commute to work or working out at the gym or relaxing in the bath or any time, really. And right now, you can take an audiobook for a spin with a special promotion just for our listeners from audible.com. Just go to audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics to get a free 30-day trial and download any of Audible's 180,000 titles for free. That's audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or click the sponsor link on our webpage to download the free audiobook of your choice. And now back to the show. We're back, and today I'm talking with Dr. Francis Collins, director of the National Institutes of Health and the former head of the Human Genome Project. Well, Dr. Collins, the thing that's exciting to me is this idea that I would just be able to go in to my doctor and have my entire genome mapped out and know what the red flags are. Um, but I think right now, you know, the idea of that, it costs, I think, something like seven or $8,000, I heard. Will Less that, that drop now, quickly? it's down to about a thousand, and it's oh, is it really? Drop. Oh, okay. So this is entirely affordable, and it's available now. Uh, it is available, but you have to do some uh, uh, sort of checking around to see where you might get it done. I think it's still not something that most people are ready to sign up for. I think the right. time will come, though, uh, where this will be something that, because of its medical utility, people will wish to have in their medical record, and maybe even third parties will decide it's worth paying for, although they're not there yet. Uh, we aim to try to generate some more evidence about the utility of this, and maybe that okay. will help. So, yeah, so if I were to pay that $1,000 right now and go get my genomes mapped out, uh what would that tell me? What would I be able to do with that? Would that show me the red flags that I need to watch or, or, or talk to my doctor about? Um, that's part of the challenge is mm. a lot of the interpretation is still not that straightforward. Certainly, you could be advised that in your genome, uh, there are places where you have a spelling that makes your risk of diabetes or heart disease or cancer higher or lower than the average person, but it would be a modest uh, effect, and it would be a statistical recommendation. It wouldn't necessarily be yes or no. In fact, most of the time, okay. it wouldn't be. So is that kind of information at the present time something people are clamoring for? Well, maybe not so much because it doesn't really have that much action associated with it. One area where I think it will start to be interesting for people to have this information is actually what we call pharmacogenomics, which is a big clunky word. But what it means is if you know your own DNA sequence and you're having a drug prescribed, there's a better chance that the dose can be chosen so that it's right for you as opposed to too much or too little or even okay. a better chance to say, ooh, that's not a drug that you should have because you're the one who's going to have a bad side effect of that. There are more than 100 drugs now for which we know that information, but it's not being used because most of the time when you're having a prescription written, your DNA sequence is not available. So people just make the best guess, and we kind of mm -hmm. do one size fits all drug prescribing. We could do better than that. And I think as more data builds up behind the usefulness of that kind of approach, more and more people will want to have that information in their medical record so the doc can adjust the plan accordingly. This all assumes, of course, that docs will know how to do this, and we have a big challenge getting physicians and other health professionals ready for the era of genomic medicine because most of them have not right. had the opportunity to learn much about it so far. Right, and this leads into my next question because I want to talk about some of the specific initiatives that have been started on your watch at the NIH. Uh, one of them is the Precision Medicine Initiative. Through advances in research, technology, and policies that empower patients, PMI will enable a new era of precision medicine long envisioned by you and many others in which researchers, providers, and patients work together to develop more individualized care. Um, you know, we can map the genome and we can have all the information, but if we don't have specific treatments and medicines to target these very specific diseases, uh, then, it, it, then there's no point. How much of us being able to fight disease in the future will come down to being able to come up with very precise treatments and targeted treatments? 
and also how to keep people healthy because it's about prevention as well. Well, that's exactly oh, really? what this precision medicine initiative aims to do is to develop the evidence that this kind of information can keep people healthy or if they fall ill can do a better job of treating them. To do that, you need a very large group of people because of the individual differences. You want to be able to perceive their effect, and you need mm -hmm. to collect a lot of data. And yeah. let me hasten to say, not just genomic data, but also environmental exposure data and lifestyle and diet and exercise and behavior and all those things that play out in terms of health or illness. So that's what this project aims to do, to ask a million Americans to sign up as volunteers and as full partners in this effort, and to ask them uh, to make available all kinds of information about their health and their dietary practices and their electronic health records, uh, to have blood specimens uh, taken and sampled for a variety of different things, including uh, when it gets affordable, their complete genome sequences, and even to walk around with various wearable sensors that keep track of what their body performance is like that day and what kind of environmental exposures they might have. Mm -hmm. This will be the largest, most comprehensive longitudinal database of America that you could possibly imagine. And we're getting it started this year. And this is pretty revolutionary in terms of the kind of insights that are going to flow from it, but it won't happen overnight. In terms of specific treatments in precision medicine, when you're dealing with large pharmaceutical companies, is there the problem that you get to a point where, you know, you can come up with a precise treatment, but it's not profitable because there's, there simply aren't enough customers for that? Well, there is this concern that the more we figure out individual differences and then realize that there aren't going to be blockbusters anymore that you offer to everybody, will that yeah. ruin the profitability uh, of the drug uh, companies? I don't think so, and I think most people who've looked carefully at this would say no, because there's a much more balancing kind of effect, and that is that you now have the ability uh, to take people with a particular disorder and identify those that are most likely to respond to a new therapy. And thus, a lot of therapies that would have basically failed in the clinic before because they didn't seem to be working might actually be working quite nicely for 10% of the people and you'll know which 10% they are and so that drug will end up getting approved. That should mean then that the failure rate in drug development, which is incredibly high, it's about 99%, uh, will come down and ultimately then that will improve the financial status of those companies that are trying to build these new medicines. Okay. And another interesting initiative that's been established on your watch you started the Accelerating Medicines Partnership, which is a public-private partnership to increase the number of new diagnostics and therapies for patients and reduce the time and costs of developing them. Um, the largest impediment to new treatments and drugs has been the FDA. Now, the FDA is involved in this initiative. How is that being addressed from their standpoint? Well, I wouldn't agree with what you just said about the FDA being the largest okay. impediment. I think <laughs> yeah. the FDA does what they're asked to do, which is to review data that companies send them about whether a particular drug is safe and effective. And actually, they do a pretty good job of that. They're faster than the Europeans are, for instance. I think okay. the largest impediment is there just haven't been that many success stories coming to them of new drugs that actually have been shown to be safe and effective, although that's getting better all the time. The Accelerating Medicines Partnership aims, with FDA involved and 10 pharmaceutical companies and NIH, uh, to figure out ways that we could take a lot of the new information that's coming forward about the causes of diseases, in this case it's diabetes, it's Alzheimer's disease, it's rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, and apply that as quickly as possible to identify new therapeutic pathways that haven't yet been uh, perceived. So this is a open access, pre-competitive partnership, all the information's available, but the companies are willing to put their money into this because they too are looking for new drug targets and they think this is a good way to find them by working together instead of everybody behind their own curtain. Okay. In your work as a genome hunter, you have collaborated with a number of researchers targeting specific diseases, and as we've discussed as director at the NIH, many of your initiatives have been about encouraging collaboration 
whether it's uh, private pharmaceutical companies, the FDA, government research, colleges, scientific researchers, and scientific researchers and pharmaceutical companies can be famously territorial. Do you run into that very much? Absolutely, but I do think <laughs> things are moving in the right direction. The Genome Project really started something by the po folks who worked on that uh, rebelled against this idea of being territorial and agreed <laughs> that all of the data coming from the Genome Project ought to be made publicly accessible to anybody every 24 hours. And that was pretty radical at the time. But it has become more and more the norm that if you're running a big collaborative effort where the data that you're generating is going to be of great interest uh, to lots of other scientists, and the real goal here is to advance progress, that there's no justification for hoarding your data or even waiting until publication to release it. So many of these projects now are following the Genome Project model of immediate access, and I think that's great. And NIH is certainly uh, in a leadership role here insisting on that kind of data release. And of course, we give out a lot of grants, and so we have some leverage here about people who accept grants from us. The understanding is you're going to have to share, you're going to have to make your data available. Well, that's great. Well, uh, one of the other projects that you're working on is the BRAIN Initiative. It stands for Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies. What kind of things are you working on there? Well, this is a truly bold effort to try to understand how the most complex structure in the known universe functions, that is the human brain, with 86 billion neurons in the brain, each of which has about 1,000 connections. Uh, this is an incredibly complex, but obviously really important and fascinating structure. And we know a certain amount about how individual neurons in the brain do what they do, and we also can image the brain and even see what's happening in real time by things like functional MRI. But there's a whole lot of really important features of the brain that we don't understand at all. We don't understand how the circuits in the brain do what they do in order to allow you to do some complex kind of uh, function, like simply uh, looking at an object and knowing what it is, or hearing somebody's voice down the hall that you haven't spoken to in five years and immediately knowing who it is. We don't know how you do that. Yeah. And the goal here is to develop and then apply those technologies that would allow us not to look at an occasional cell in the brain or to look at the whole brain as one big thing, but all those intermediate levels where you can look at circuits and see what they're doing in real time and begin to figure out the logic of how the brain does its amazing things. And the first five years of this brain initiative is really technology development, and then the next five years is applying that and ultimately build a foundation that will help us really understand conditions like autism and schizophrenia and traumatic brain injury and Alzheimer's and all the rest, for yeah. which we currently are kind of working with only a rudimentary knowledge of the normal function of the brain. Yeah, well, it certainly sounds like you've got your hands full over there. Before oh, yeah. we go, you're an evangelical Christian, and your faith has been a big part of your life. What do you say to Christians who might say they fear that genomics and cloning might be playing God? Well, I think we need to be in those conversations. I certainly would not argue uh, for a minute that science ought to just go forward regardless of its consequences. That would be a very unfortunate stance to take. But I do think that if we sit down across the table and talk with uh, people from various perspectives, uh, regardless of their faith or, or their uh, otherwise sort of ethical framework, we can often come to a pretty good consensus about what things ought to be done and what things ought not to be done. Right now, for instance, there's a debate about whether human embryos ought to be modified, have their genomes edited mm -hmm. using this thing called CRISPR-Cas. And the strong conclusion of everybody involved is, no, we shouldn't go there. And that would certainly include the Christians, because that would seem very much like playing God. But it includes a lot of atheists as well. So I think our differences in this area of where science should be applied are not as great as some people assume. Yes, and you have shown a lot of leadership in encouraging these conversations among people of faith and scientists and researchers. So uh, you deserve a lot of credit for that. And it sounds like you are doing some truly exciting work over at the NIH, and uh, I think there are more advances going on right now than there have been for probably decades at the NIH. You've, you've really brought it up to speed with the 21st century, and you deserve a lot of credit for that. Well, Dr. Francis Collins, I really appreciate your coming on the show. Thanks for joining me. Nice to chat with you today. Thanks for inviting me. 
Thanks again to Dr. Francis Collins for coming on the show. You can follow Dr. Collins on Twitter at at NIH Director. You can learn more about the Human Genome Project by visiting genome.gov, and you can learn more about some of the exciting new research going on at the National Institutes of Health at NIH.gov. I hope you'll subscribe to Kick-Ass Politics on iTunes and leave us a review. You can also help us reach our fundraising goal for this year and get rewarded by donating to our Patreon campaign at patreon.com backslash kickasspolitics or click on the Patreon link in the show notes for this episode. Follow us on Twitter at at KA Politics or visit Kickass Politics on Facebook. And while you're there, recommend Kick-Ass Politics to your friends on your social media. And as always, I welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions at comments at kickasspolitics.com. But for now, I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kick-Ass Politics. Kick-Ass Politics is a trademark of Mathis Entertainment, Inc.